35. So hello everyone and welcome to Racial Equity and Occupational Science, a virtual event for strategy building. My name is Kalia Johnson. I am chair of membership for SSO USA and your moderator for the afternoon. Now, before we begin, get these slides going. <laughs> uh, we're gonna go over a few housekeeping items. So to reduce your data and bandwidth use, we ask that you please turn off your video and similarly to optimize our auditory experiences and to avoid distractions, we ask that you keep your mics on mute. Now that doesn't mean we don't wanna hear from you. If you're experiencing technical difficulties, please let us know in the chat box and someone from our team will help you troubleshoot. And if you have questions for our panelists during the presentation, please drop them in the chat box as well as soon as our moderators reopen the chat box. And if you're sharing your thoughts or quotes from the panelists on Instagram or Twitter, please tag SSOUSA at OXI underscore USA and use the hashtags OXICHAT and SSO Virtual 2020. And if you register to receive contact hours, you must attend the panel, the breakout session, the recap, and complete the post panel survey. And lastly, the panel portion of this event is recorded and will be made available following the event. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Charles Christensen for opening remarks from the Board of Directors. Thank you, Kalila, and welcome everyone to this first ever virtual meeting of the Society for the Study of Occupation USA. Uh, I'm really indebted to the conference committee for um, the, putting together a brilliant and timely program on a topic of great interest to us all. And I have a feeling that this program may be the first of a long series of programs of interest to occupational therapists and occupational scientists around the world as we move ahead. We certainly aim for the society to explore topics of broad interest and relevance to occupational therapy and occupational science. And if this is your first experience with our society, we hope you will learn and give consideration to becoming a member of our society. So thank you so much. And back to you, Kalila, for what looks like it's gonna be a fantastic program. Yeah, thank you, Chuck. Um, on behalf of the board of directors, I would also like to take a moment and extend heartfelt congratulations again to our new board members and to all of you who achieved professional and educational milestones. And special kudos to our poster presenters whose work can be viewed online at www.sso-usa.net. Please remember to check out their scholarship during the So USA has a mission to build the body of occupational science in service to humanity. The society's values are listed for your review, but I want to draw your attention to the three C's, collegiality, so which is our cooperation and shared responsibility, collaboration, and critical discourse. It is through these lenses that our shared occupational experiences, particularly in the context of racial unrest here in the United States, brought us to consider how occupational science is intentional or not and equitable in our research, education and student development, advocacy and justice. Therefore, the purpose of this virtual event is to provide opportunity and a platform for occupational scientists, occupational therapy practitioners, students and others to hear from those with Sorry. experience and expertise in promoting racial equity, and then come together to explore and develop actionable strategies to promote racial equity in education, research, advocacy, and application of occupational science knowledge. So by the end of this experience, you should have a more nuanced understanding of the ways in which racism is taken up and enacted through occupational science research and education, recognize the impact of a racially equitable occupational science on OT education and practice, and identify strategies to promote and support anti-racism in occupational science broadly. Activities for the remainder of the event are as follows. I'll review community rules, introduce our esteemed panelists, which by the way, if our panelists could keep their videos on, um, that would be great. Um, followed by remarks and discussion between the panelists. We will then field questions from the chat and social media 
then break into our small group um, workshop session. And then after the breakout session, we'll hear from you all about your recommendations for building racial equity. And then we'll adjourn for the SSO tweet up on Twitter. Before we begin, I want to review a few community rules to guide our conversation. We would like for you all to, to speak from your own experience and respect the experiences of others by offering space for everyone to complete their thoughts. Please keep your questions or comments to two, three minutes um, if you have a chance to speak on camera. Um, do not be afraid to respectfully challenge each other because our goal here is not to agree, it's to gain a deeper understanding. And so as my five-year-old niece would say, let's get into it. Our first panelist is Dr. Arame Anverizadeh. Dr. Anveri Zadeh is the Director of Admissions and Associate Professor of Clinical Occupational Therapy at the USC Mrs. T. H. Chan Division of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy. She is a founding member and chair-elect of the Coalition of Occupational Therapy Advocates for Diversity, known as COTAD, a nonprofit organization striving to empower occupational therapy leaders to engage in practices that increase diversity, equity, and inclusion for a more transformative occupational therapy profession. She is responsible for developing the COTAD toolkit, the IGNITE series, and COTAD chapters. Dr. Anveri Zade works tirelessly to establish and support COTAD chapters at academic programs across the country while empowering students to facilitate dialogue, awareness, and change related to issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, not just in the profession, but beyond. Welcome, Dr. Anveri Zade, and thank you for joining us today. Arami. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson, for the lovely introduction. Can you all hear me okay? Am I good? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so thank you again for SSO for inviting me to be on this panel. I am so honored to be speaking alongside these esteemed panelists. So hello, everyone, and good morning from the West Coast. I'm here in Los Angeles. And good afternoon for all of my other time zone folks. We have been asked to discuss why racial equity is necessary in occupational science, as well as how we address racial equity in our work. So as I reflected on this question, I kept circling back to the same thought. The thought that we must incorporate a racial and ethnic equity perspective throughout the occupational science research process so that we can inform policies, programs, and public opinion on solutions to eliminate health inequity. By doing this, we are laser focused on our profession's mission in ensuring that all, and I emphasize all, people can participate in meaningful occupations that contribute to the health and well-being of the community. And that is the bottom line. This is the main reason why racial equity matters in occupational science, education, and advocacy. The population health and the racial injustices that have impacted our communities through policies, practices, and procedures in housing, healthcare, racial wealth gap gaps, policing, criminal conviction, war on drugs, and education are all intimately connected. These are just a few of the historical systemic barriers created in this country to marginalize communities of color, which ultimately create disparities and disproportionalities. So when I speak about decreasing health inequities, I am also making connection to a person's health being a product of their environment. According to Ashfer and Farr, a healthy community is one in which all people have access to quality education, safe and healthy homes, adequate employment, transportation, physical activity, and nutrition, in addition to quality health care. Unhealthy communities lead to chronic disease, such as cancers, diabetes, and health disease. Occupational science has a responsibility not to perpetuate inequalities, disparities, and stereotypes about communities of color. Rather, our role as therapists and scientists is to distinguish the occupational barriers and injustices and be advocates for all people to have access to a healthy community. This is why we must ask ourselves intentional questions 
in our respective roles. In addition to asking, we should also develop strategic action plans in addressing them. Questions such as, why is diverse representation so important in OT education, research and practice are key. Specifically looking at education, why do we need to intentionally recruit diverse students, develop holistic admissions, decolonize the curriculum, recruit diverse faculty and provide tenure, provide safe spaces for our students? For research, why do we need to have researchers from diverse backgrounds that conduct research for and about communities of color? How are researchers intentional about developing research questions and designs that aim to advance racial and ethnic equity? Are community members viewed as partners? How are we examining the history and the values of the community? Is bias influencing the study? And before, when we think about practice, are we emphasizing the idea that occupations promote health and justice? This is critical in creating a culture that fosters diversity, equity, and inclusion with our clients and with our colleagues. Why do these questions matter? Before I discuss why these questions are so important, I want to share a short personal story. It's a brief summary for the sake of time. So when I was a sophomore in undergrad, when I discovered occupational therapy in my organic chemistry class, I fell in love but I just knew I was going to be a neurosurgeon. I was pre-med, I was pre-med track. I was going to be a neurosurgeon, but I love the idea of occupational therapy. So I made the switch to OT. And when I embarked on my journey, I recall being the only African-American student. I remember that every single research article that I, I read did not highlight any populations of color. This also included the majority of the case studies that we received. And reviewed. I remember developing a proposal about creating diverse spaces and it was dismissed. I remember that I experienced my, experienced my first professor who looked like me when I was receiving my doctorate. That class I took was in the public policy school and that was the first time ever that I was able to conduct research. The study was looking at the differences in access to health care and healthy food options between wealthier neighborhoods and so-called minority communities, poor neighborhoods in Los Angeles County. Now, as I respect, reflect on some of my experience, I can honestly say that that research experience changed my life because I saw someone who looked like me engaging in work in communities that I felt connected to. The work was powerful and it was meaningful. It also solidified that my doctoral work was going to be specifically focused on communities of color. Until then, I had not been exposed to dialogue about occupational science research in communities of color or conducted by people of color. I am thankful since being a practitioner, I've had opportunities to be an intervener for the USC pressure ulcer prevention study where diverse representation and research was more intentional. I also share these experiences to emphasize the significance of representation in all levels. Representation in the classroom inspired me. When I got a glimpse of it in research, it intrigued me even more. That was something, it was something palpable. It made me feel alive. I envisioned myself making this type of impact in every aspect of my career, which I have done and which I continue to do. Now, fast forward 15 years later, Currently, as the Director of Admissions, I address racial equity in my daily work. I, along with my team, developed and established holistic admissions at USC this past year. And for the first time ever in the division's history, we admitted the most diverse cohort ever, which includes individuals who identify as Latinx, Black, LGBTQIA+, people with disabilities, veterans, first generation, undocumented, and older learners. I also initiated the dialogue about developing inclusive pedagogy, where we are looking at ways to decolonize curriculum. I have decreased barriers for access to scholarships. And more importantly, I have mentored numerous students, especially of color. And my goal is to inspire and to stress to them that they are valued and that their lived narratives matter. It is a true ripple effect when I see that these same students become leaders in our profession. Now, as a co-founder and co uh, co-tad 
and COTAD chapter curricula co coordinator, I am so proud to see students across the country passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion. They are taking a lead in this work, which is so important for the future of our profession. And beyond influencing students to stay empowered, COTAC for almost a decade now has been dedicated in making sure that occupational therapy is accessible, inclusive, and effective for all. We have done this through creating programs such as the Ignite series, through extensive advocacy work, and through being a consistent voice for our profession. In closing, to circle back to all of those questions I mentioned earlier, my personal story alone depicts the impact that diverse representation and lived experiences have on our profession. It also reminds us as educators, as researchers, leaders, practitioners, and students that the implied or explicit assumption that white is the normative standard or default position clouds our ability to eliminate health disparities. Rather, having diverse representation at the table to advocate for policies and law is significant in addressing racial equity. It is naive to think that one workshop, one panel, or even a statement will solve the problem of systemic and institutional barriers. But we must begin to change the stories that we tell about ourselves and about others. I am glad OT is paying attention. I am encouraged that we have so many individuals in our profession ignited about this work. I am excited to see conferences like this one focusing specifically on this topic. Holding our profession accountable for developing standards, initiatives, and strategies that focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice is key. Accreditation standards, practice standards, diverse representation standards, holistic education standards, and research standards. Being vocal, strategic, and action-oriented about dismantling individual, interpersonal, institutional, and structural racism in academia and at our place of work and within our communities is vital. And by understanding the relationship between systemic barriers and occupational justice, we can better see the connection between communities and health disparities. We can better be equipped in how we work with communities who have been impacted by generational trauma and injustice. And research truly has the power to guide the change. Remember that intention does not equal impact. We have to make a connection to what impact and a commitment to what impact we will make in dismantling systemic barriers in occupational therapy education, research, practice, and within our communities. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Ambarizade, and for all of our young, like budding occupational scientists on this call, she just laid out your program of research. All right, so I hope you were taking notes. Um, thank you. <laughs> our second panelist is Mr. Dave Thomas. Mr. Thomas is an occupational therapist, public health specialist with a remit in social justice, and doctor of philosophy candidate in higher education. His research focuses on the impact of westernized ontologies, epistemologies, and pedagogies in shaping educational trajectories, achievement, and interests for racially minoritized students in higher ed. Mr. Thomas is currently employed as a diversity and inclusion practitioner at the University of Kent, where he works as a student success and attainment, excuse me, attainment manager in the Division of Natural Sciences. He is a consultant to Advanced HE on race, inclusion, and equality, and a member of the Health and Care Professions Council Diversity Forum. He has published research in the areas of race, inequality, occupational justice, and social justice. Additionally, Mr. Thomas is the lead editor of Doing Equity and Diversity in Success, or for Success, excuse me, in Higher Education, published by Pelgrave Macmillan 2020, and Towards Decolonizing the University, a Kaleidoscope for Empowered Action, published by Counterpress Oxford 2020. Thank you for joining us this evening from the UK. Mr. Thomas, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Kalila. And <clears throat> thank you, colleagues, um, for having me. Uh, it is my extreme pleasure to be with you today. Now, um, 
I think today we're going to get up to some trouble, some good trouble, but necessary trouble, right? So um, just be warned. <laughs> so the complex nature of human engagement in meaningful occupations is a process that centers on human relations. This, I believe, can be aligned with the African philosophy Ubuntu. Now, Ubuntu says a person is a person through other persons. In this sense, our humanity is realized through humanity of others, through relationships, compassion, and interdependence. I believe human relations are culturally, temporally, ecologically contextualized. Racial inequity is dehumanizing. When you dehumanize me, you dehumanize the process. When you dehumanize me, you are dehumanized in the process. Historically, human occupation has often been a site both for resistance to and reproduction of the social order. Social orders often perpetuate repressive social orders and vice versa. Therefore, the role of occupation as a means of promoting justice, optimum health, and well being can also be juxtaposed with this antithesis that is, the role of occupation in promoting injustice. And we see this across the globe um, in today in all our societies. Now, the founder of occupational science, Elizabeth Yextra, and colleagues posited that. The science of occupation could help the profession contribute new knowledge and skill to the eradication of complex problems affecting societies globally today. Race inequality is a wicked problem and arguably one of the most maleficent, insidious, destructive problems facing societies globally today. In a time when the everyday lived experiences of racially minoritized people are steeped in racism and racialized violence, racial equity, equality, and the mattering of lives warrant greater importance. As a precursor to racial equality, racial equity is about impartiality and fairness. Racial equality is realized where all lives matter in a sense where they are all of equal value and equal worth. So what does this have to do with occupational therapy and occupational science? In my role as an educator, an occupational therapist, a researcher, and a diversity and inclusion practitioner, I'm very, very concerned with matters relating to racial inequity and operationalize this in practice by promoting occupational justice. In my opinion, occupational justice should be perceived as a subset, a derivative or complementary to social justice. Occupational justice has the potential to bridge the gap between persistent pervasive social conditions that dehumanize what racially minoritized people can do what they can be, and also what they can become, and also their capacity to achieve and sustain optimum well-being, and most importantly, a sense of belonging. Therefore, as faculty and administrators, what does it mean to promote occupational justice for students in post-secondary education? Students who emanate from a range of cultural, social, demographic backgrounds with varying life experiences. In my opinion, it means departing from socially constructed racialized paradigms and harnessing the power of cultural sensitivity. It means empowering students to advocate for social transformation through collective occupations. It also means mediating collaborative dialogues aimed at understanding and interrupting systemic inequalities. And it means creating occupational opportunities to stimulate and sustain equity, diversity, and inclusivity 
through the redistribution of opportunities and resources. And I see this happening in four dimensions, structurally, epistemically, through epistemic disobedience, personally, and relationally. Now, we've, we've found ourselves somehow in a situation where coronavirus has, you know, it's trending across the globe. And the pandemic has now seen a methodological shift in the provision of education globally, adopting a strong focus online and blended styles of learning with all its co-committant issues related to disparities. And we know these. The role of social interaction in developing cognition, mental functioning, and well being becomes more pertinent at a time when COVID 19 has prompted isolation and a risk of vulnerability because most institutions have been forced to transfer the provision online. Assimilation and deficit notions are easily reproduced, and oppressive systems that serve to preserve structural inequalities by asphyxiating all people who are not considered as being racialized as white are equally easily produced. So I advocate for a more inclusive, holistic focus on creating and sustaining systemic practices and processes and policies to promote inclusion for all students, primarily students who are disproportionately affected and marginalized. My focus situates an appreciation for diversity and cultural sensitivity as central to our provisions rather than a knee-jerk reaction to crisis. Promoting occupational justice by way of students and staff achievement and rewarding experience goes way beyond the provision and consumption of data and information. Sustainable success relies on the underwriting of these aspirations with financial and human resources and a commitment by senior management and or leaders in our institutions to effect and sustain change. So how is this realized in practice? I propose three precepts that are imperative to promoting racial equity in occupational science and occupational therapy as a discipline. Number one, the development of collaborative conversations, not confrontations, collaborative conversations to understand and interrupt systemic inequalities. Number two, confronting the uncomfortable truths about the legacy of colonialism and imperialism and the discipline of occupational therapy's relationship with these atrocities. And most importantly, acknowledging the harm that has been caused to black, indigenous, and other people of color, and how this is being reproduced on a daily basis. And thirdly, and most importantly, making reparations for the legacy of atrocities by moving apologies and solidarity statements to action and evidencing these actions with what I call a race equality receipt. So the actions, in my opinion, it's an invitation to treat. But you need the receipt before you leave the department store. And that shows proof of purchase. So for me, statements are okay. You know, they signal intent. But what is important is the race equality receipt. Actions, tangible, sustainable actions towards redress. So we're thinking about reparation. We're thinking about redistribution of power. We're thinking about acknowledging the atrocities and we're thinking about collaborative conversations, not leaving it at confrontations. We want to move the dial forward now. How do we repair the damage and make this an equitable, sustainable environment for all, particularly those who are most affected? Colleagues, how good and how pleasant it is to share fellowship with you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much. Um, and you have touched on something that I think um, ha in occupational science we've been grappling with and has probably been made evident through the pledge 
um, by the editors of the Journal of Occupational Science with redressing um, race and racism um, in, in the ways that we study occupation. And uh, we'll, we're, we're gonna come back to that a little bit. So I'll give you an opportunity to unpack your, your recommendations a little further. So thank you so much for that. Okay, and our third esteemed panelist this evening is Dr. Jaime Munoz. Dr. Munoz is an associate professor and chair of the Department of Occupational Therapy in the John G. Rango Senior School of Health Sciences at Duquesne University. His scholarly interests focus on community-based practice, as well as exploring the scope of occupational therapy practice in criminal justice systems in the United States and abroad. Dr. Munoz has a sustained interest in developing and measuring outcomes of community-based OT programming with historically marginalized populations. His interests are informed by more than 30 years of practice and educational experiences. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Munoz. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Um, honored, I'm humbled um, by uh, your introduction and your invitation to participate in this panel. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Anzaraz, Anzaraz, I'm sorry, Anzarazade and- Anzarazade. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, people struggle with my name, I'm struggling with yours. It's all good. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and Mr. Thomas, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, everybody else who here, what they said, uh, they did a, a fantastic job, I'm going to, uh, follow a bit of both of their leads, uh, tell some stories, and uh, introduce myself. Um, maybe that's the first thing to do is to, to try to situate um, who I am. We all come here today uh, to have a conversation, and we all bring with us, you know, different perspectives. Uh, it's fantastic to see uh, such a um, strong international uh, group of folks here, and and perhaps if I share some of my own identities and experiences, politics, views. Um, you get a better sense of where I'm coming from with some of the topics that we're talking about today. Um, I'm 61. I'm a third generation Mexican-American male. Uh, hablo y entiendo un poco español, pero no muy bien. I speak and I understand Spanish a little bit, but not good. Uh, my parents shared stories as I came up uh, about their negative experiences with racism. They schooled all my brothers and sisters and I. Uh, how to avoid trouble um, that always didn't work with me. Um, they gave us American names. Um, as a child, my family called me Jamie. Uh, I didn't claim Jaime uh, until high school when it was apparent that others saw my race even though I felt like I was wearing it like some invisible emotional clothing. It was important to other people. Um, my parents only spoke English in the home, uh, except to each other. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. I have eight siblings. I have 84 first cousins on my mother's side. Um, I'm from a family of artists, educators, service workers, and increasingly uh, healthcare professionals. I was raised in a Catholic household, went to a Catholic grade school and a Catholic high school, I consider myself more spiritual than religious. Uh, I'm married to an OT. My youngest sister is an OT. I have a niece that's an OT and my eldest daughter, uh, who may be on this call, Hola Dina, um, is training to become an OT. I was born in the Midwest. Hola, papa. Ah, <laughs> I've lived there. I've lived in Chicago, Ann Arbor, Boston, Albuquerque. I've now lived in Pittsburgh for more than 25 years. Um, and uh, my master's thesis focused on how we as practitioners think with models, specifically the model of human occupation. My doctoral studies focused on culturally responsive caring, a little bit of what Dave was talking about and in terms of how we build those skills and abilities to, to interact with each other. Um, and for the past, um, couple of decades, I've, I've really been more focused on community-based practice uh, and the last decade and a half with a lot of my colleagues in, in the Justice-Based Occupational Therapy Initiative, many of whom are on the call today, um, uh, focusing on criminal justice. And that focus serves as um, 
a lens that might help you understand some of my perspectives better. Uh, I'm not sure what everyone here uh, on uh, the call today knows about the criminal justice system, but the public murder of George Floyd and, and the no-knock execution of Breonna Taylor kind of made us all kind of pay attention in a different way, or maybe made more people pay attention in a different way. Um, in general, a criminal justice system is supposed to prevent crime from happening, um, prevent a criminal from repeating a crime, um, punish that person for committing a crime. Rehabilitation um, is rarely the goal. Um, there aren't a whole lot of nations in the world that can boast that their criminal justice system is substantially reducing crime uh, or upholds justice to our society, the victim, the perpetrator. Um, incarceration in it of itself is a particularly ineffective rehabilitation method. But um, in the United States, it's, a, it's an epidemic. We, we can talk about mass incarceration as a public health problem in, in the US. And the reason why I relate this in particular as a lens for looking at, at equity and, and justice is that to me, our criminal justice system is a place where a lot of, um, a lot of different kinds of injustices converge. The criminal justice system is where people are housed, but what it manifests is a reflection of, you know, um, economic injustice, housing injustice, educational injustice, healthcare injustice. Those things all converge in our criminal justice system. So um, it's this it's this space where um, where that convergence happens. Um, people in um, in our um, justice system um, they they worry about um, their employability. Um, criminal justice systems in our society destabilize families. Uh, they devastate communities. Um, people in criminal justice systems are disproportionately economically impoverished. There are individuals from ethnic and uh, racial minority groups. Uh, there are people who lack political voice. Um, they experience systematic disparities in healthcare, education, employment, income, mental health care. Um, they enter this system with social and health problems. Um, and when they get out, um, their most likely outcome is to go back in. Um, they experience financial hardship, inadequate housing, again, mental illness, poor social, social relationships, substance abuse, limited access to education uh, and unemployment. Many of those are issues that they were dealing with before they went in. So I'm gonna tell a story and hope to connect this to occupational science. I'll tell a story of Dwayne. It's a name that I'm just making up, but um, in one of the projects that I worked on here in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania was called the Community Reintegration Project. It was at our Allegheny County Jail, um, which um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the justice system, um, you know, jails typically are in communities. Um, they're more accessible. Um, people there are, 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 um, are arrested, but they're not necessarily convicted. Uh, they may be waiting for a sentence. Um, they may be serving out a, a, uh, a sentence. Um, people in prison are usually sequestered outside somewhere else. They're outside of, of, of um, cities, uh, more rural oftentimes, at least in the US. Um, and the Allegheny County Jail Project, we worked with men um, that were within 90 days of getting out. Um, they had a release date. We had some inpatient or in jail um, services and we followed them for a year. Typically in that jail and across the nation, um, six to seven out of 10 men and women uh, who go into a jail will return to a jail. They will recidivate. Um, our program reduced that significantly. Uh, we followed them for a year. 
I took on a different study looking at the ones that stayed out. How did they manage to do that? What changed? Uh, and sometimes I found occupation was uh, a change. And um, I tell this story because I think that um, Dwayne's story, he didn't get occupational therapy, but he found occupation. So Dwayne lived in one of the most um, challenging communities in Pittsburgh, uh, challenged by poverty, challenged by uh, poor educational um, achievement. Uh, uh, kids in that neighborhood were, were extremely likely to not graduate from high school. Um, uh, poor health care, a lot of houses that were boarded up, um, low vacancy uh, in, in many areas. Um, I met Wayne uh, in this program and met him again a year after uh, when I recruited him for this study. Um, Wayne was in his late 40s. Uh, he had been in and out of the Allegheny County Jail for uh, since he was 18. Um, I think when I met him, he had been um, incarcerated for the 11th time. Um, and everybody in his family had pretty much disowned him except his grandmother, who he always went to live with, and um, met Wayne and, and at his grandmother's, and we were talking about how he managed to, to stay out for a year. Um, and Wayne told me this story. He said one day he was shooting baskets at the, um, at the playground of the church that was directly across where he lived. And uh, he was shooting baskets, and the pastor approached him, and said, uh, Wayne, I need your help. The uh, youth counselor has been in a terrible automobile accident and I don't have anyone to run the boys club. And Wayne couldn't help but stop, but start laughing and said, Father, you don't want me talking to the boys. What, what are you doing? What are you thinking about? Um, father was persistent. He convinced Wayne, um, told Wayne, asked Wayne if he knew what the boys club was all about and Wayne did not. And he said, well, it's about helping the boys realize they need to stay in school and stay out of jail. And I think you know something about jail. And I think your knowledge can help these boys. So Wayne agreed. And it took a while for the, um, for the youth pastor to come back. Uh, so Wayne was the, was the, uh, the counselor there for, for weeks, for months. Um, Wayne started creating this new identity of being the, um, the guy that did the youth club. And then he got those guys to do things around the neighborhood and give back to that neighborhood. They were cleaning up yards of, of elders and they were uh, fixing gardens and, and things that Wayne saw the neighborhood needed. Um, the point of this story is that Wayne didn't get occupational therapy and nothing in his context of poverty and drug use uh, and people all around him um, and who had served time with him being in the same neighborhood, um, his own employability, his own education, none of those things changed. What changed was the way that he was involved in occupation in that in that, uh, in that challenged community. And so the way I relate this back to occupational science is that, um, again, the criminal justice system is a place where many injustices come to converge. Um, we can do something about that. I think as occupational therapists and as occupational scientists, we can transform that system. Um, on the other hand, we need to know more about how occupation heals and how occupation creates opportunities for people, uh, how uh, we can um, use that knowledge uh, to change these, these systems and these situations. Um, as, uh, as Dave was saying, you know, the action behind our, our theories and our, um, our thoughts about how these things work. Um, so how, how do we make transformative change? Uh, I'll ask some questions like, um, um, like uh, some of our other panelists have, have, have already done. 
you know, how do we make transformative change in, uh, in justice systems to address uh, not only criminal justice, but all kinds of injustices? Um, are there standard ways that we can collectively evaluate um, whether we're having an impact? Uh, we're doing a lot of piecemeal stuff. Um, how do we, um, how do we get entrenched systems like our criminal justice systems move from a model of, of punishment to rehabilitation? Um, I think focusing on occupation may be um, one way. Um, we need to prove it. How do we generate that evidence that demonstrates that occupation has uh, a consistently positive impact on the person, on the community, uh, and in the area of criminal justice on public safety? Um, how do we frame something like um, incarceration as a public health problem that occupational therapists can work on? Um, and, and what is our role within that in terms of preventing? Um, and how do we make sure that um, we direct our efforts uh, around occupational justice in those communities that are most impacted by, by crime? Um, that's all I've got to say for now. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Dr. Munoz. I think you you really touched on something that will help us transition nicely into, um, you know, our next discussion and thinking about um, sort of these, these settings where, uh, like you said, it's a, a site where multiple injustices converge and then thinking about the positionality of occupational science um, in, in addressing those, those issues. Um, and so what I want to bring us back to is uh, a point you made earlier about um, the very public lynching of Mr. George Floyd and also the, the murder of Breonna Taylor. And what we saw after that happened is that you had countless colleges and universities, um, occupational science and occupational therapy programs, politicians, heads of state, all sorts of organizations post sweeping statements in support of Black lives. Right. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the editors of the Journal of Occupational Science even pledged a commitment to, and I quote, fight against global racism through the study of occupation. So that is, as a community of scholars, occupational scientists are or should be well positioned to harness the power of occupation for individual and social good. That's the claim. Now, I am certain every person on this call believes in this potential. Um, but Frank Cronenberg, who I am almost certain is still on the call, and Brenda Began in recent commentaries have called attention to the blinding omission of racism in occupational science literature, explicitly naming and framing it has not been a common practice in our discipline. So the first question I will pose to you all is, are we, are we truly in a position to weaponize occupation in the pursuit of social good? And do pledges in some way provide a compass for that pursuit? Like are occupational therapists ready for this fight? <laughs> well, uh, can, can I have a go at this? Yes, Dave, please. <laughs> Again, necessary trouble, good trouble. Uh, I would preface my, my answer to that question by saying all lives matter. Fundamentally, every single life matters. Equal value, equal worth. And it's for that specific reason, if we, if we accept that all lives matter and are worth the same, value the same, for that specific reason, black lives matter, right? Because black lives is part of the all lives that we're talking about. And we know that history tells us that about 300 years ago, black lives probably mattered more than it matters now from a fiscal perspective. So there were sanctions that were applied against people who sought to destroy black lives because financially the business, you know, the business at the time from a business perspective, black lives mattered more than other lives. But anyway, all lives matter. For me, it's not about statements. As I mentioned before, the, um, the race equality receipt is what I'm most interested in. 
you don't need to put a statement out that you're going to be anti-racist. Because what are you now then? If, you, if you're putting out a statement to say you're going to be anti-racist, you're trying to say, well, you're you are probably something else now, so you need to make a declaration. What I believe is that we need to um, highlight and reconcile with the, the past. That's very important. We can't change history, it has happened. But we can reconcile with the contribution of that history to what we now have. And so that's where the conflict happens, the confrontations happen, but we can't leave it there. Now, if we're truly interested in moving the dial forward, we have to redistribute the power. We have to acknowledge that because of those atrocities, some groups are more marginalized than others. So we need a redistribution. So let's look at occupational science. Are we, as, as, a, as a, a sort of a subdiscipline, embracing knowledges? And I say knowledges as plural, not knowledge. Because if we accept knowledge, it, it means that that's the absolute truth. I'm pushing it in another, in another direction. I'm looking for pluralized knowledges, knowledge systems, where knowledge emanates from all cultures, right? In, the, in occupational science, are we redistributing power whereby our academics from the global south are able to publish their thoughts, to contribute to these knowledge systems? Or are they precluded through the peer review process? So from an epistemological point of view, is there a redistribution of power? A statement is okay, but are we redistributing the power to introduce these diverse perspectives? Are we redistributing the power to ensure that we have representation in decision-making powers? Are we redistributing the power whereby we can um, ensure that a diverse range of persons access research grants? Are we redistributing the power whereby the emotional labor that comes with this type of work, diversity and inclusion, it is not burdened on one set of people. The, the people who are most affected are the people trying to fight the problem. Are we doing that? Because inequality, particularly race inequality, is everyone's business. It's not a black problem. It's not a people of color problem. It's a problem for humanity. So as occupational scientists, we have, I would say, an opportunity right now. And this is a glorious opportunity to demonstrate that we truly believe in our morals and our values. We need to be redistributing this power. We need to be the beacon of change. But are we ready for that? A statement is too easy. We need, we need a receipt. We need proof of purchase, I believe. Thank you for, for that. May I chime in also, Dr. Johnson? Yes, please, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I agree with um, Mr. Thomas about the lack of humanity. And I think that as I reflect on your question, sometimes we think that this is episodic, right? That the murder of George Floyd or Breonna Taylor is episodic and that it erupted such outrage that we recognize we can no longer be silent. And it pushed racism to the forefront of our attention. But I want us to recognize that these stories are not new. You know, these stories <laughs> have occurred throughout our history to the present day. And therefore, we are not here today, I believe, to create, create strategies because we are not lacking strategies. We're not lacking strategies at all. I think we need to really ask ourselves about the lack of humanity, which you're speaking about, um, Mr. Thomas, and really how we continue to witness over time and time again. Um, this lack of humanity and how it contributes to occupational injustice. And if we as occupational scientists, researchers, educators, practitioners understand how that contributes to occupational justice, then I believe we could position ourselves to really have the opportunity to be a, a, a pivotal voice in this, in this um, anti-racist dialogue without just 
by by actually being action oriented. And I think that's what we really need to move towards, not necessarily having a statement. And like I ended, intention is great, but it's the impact. And I think the impact comes with the action and the strategic plan of how do you want to address this? And then the question also is, are we prepared? Um, are faculty prepared? Are they, are, do they, are they um, have the understanding and how to address this? Are they confident to address this? Um, and so I think that this is this first conversation to make sure that people are confident and feel prepared moving forward in um, how do we um, position ourselves in occupational science to address this. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, to your point about, you know, are, are we even as educators sort of prepared um, to introduce this to our students um, is something that has been expressed um, by our student followers on social media. Um, in fact, um, two of our Instagram followers, um, Perks of Being a Black Girl and Daisy Three Celeste, if they're on here, expressed that they wish social justice content was integrated throughout occupational science and occupational therapy curricula, and that specific advocacy training be offered to students, researchers, and practitioners. Now, in your respective programs, do you have courses dedicated to social and occupational justice? And if not, how do you how do you introduce this to your students? Like where where does this training begin? I can speak to that. Um, I think um, it's not about a course. Um, it has to be a thread, um, in, in, in my opinion, that you know you can't be one and done. You know, you can't take a cultural competency course and, and assume that you're you know, reached some sort of, you know, competency nirvana. Um, we start early, um, introduce students to these concepts. Um, more and more what we've been trying to do is a bit of what uh, Mr. Mr. Thomas is saying. We have to hear other voices, um, intentionally going out and, and, and getting those articles from uh, our, our, uh, our colleagues in, in other countries uh, in the global south that, that are, um, giving voice in ways that that um, sometimes we in the US can't do or haven't done. Um, and, and I think that's important. So in our program, what we try to do is, is to consider it a thread. It, it's not a course, it moves throughout. Um, our program uses uh, extensive community engaged learning, uh, what used to be called, I guess, service learning. Um, and we intentionally choose the communities that we engage. Um, and those communities are places that, um, and people that uh, are um, predominantly white um, student body have never engaged before. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing. I mean, we can, we can, you know, throw the occupational science concepts at our students and, and give them, you know, examples of them. Um, but I think the challenge is finding ways to create real authentic reference points that live in the lives of our students in the ways or that, that uh, if possible to parallel the way that they live in the lives of those who are most oppressed in our societies live all the time. That is the biggest challenge, I think, because um, not having that reference point in their lives is a real challenge to really completely digesting um, these, these concepts that are related to, to occupational science and occupational justice, in my opinion. Okay, any... Um final comments from uh, Dr. Iverizade or Mr. Thomas about, about this question in particular, addressing it in, in the classrooms and offering additional training? Yes, in, in the interest of time, I'll be very brief. Mm -hmm. okay. um, you know, I, I, I genuinely believe if, if these conversations are comfortable, it means you're not doing it right. The conversations need to be uncomfortable. And people need to sit in the discomfort, work through the discomfort. Perfect example, pronunciation of names. Names are very, very important. But be uncomfortable. Be okay. If you get it wrong, it's okay. But be prepared to be corrected 
and work towards getting it right. It's uncomfortable, but make the effort, right? So I, I think when we're dealing with these, these complicated uh, socially constructed concepts, it is going to be uncomfortable. But what I would urge everyone to understand is the narratives are really, really important. In fact, they are the most important aspects, the truths. Everyone has their own truth. And so when, we, when we're talking about introducing these concepts within the curriculum, we have to be prepared to make our students and our staff uncomfortable because that is life. I think that's important. And also we, we need to understand that, you know, when students of color are speaking their truths, we also need to understand what is it or what are the barriers to our students who are not of color understanding these truths? Because it's a knowledge exchange, I believe. So if you understand my lived experiences, then that enriches your understanding of people who are not like you. We don't choose, we can't choose our clients. You know, when we, when we go in professional practice, you can't choose who comes through the door. So we need cultural competence. So I think for me, it's less about race and more about culture. You know, shared practices amongst a group of people because race is socially constructive. So we need social interventions to deconstruct that. But then we're going to be left with cultures. And how do we deal with that? Well, I think, you know, that is a perfect segue to what we're, what we're going to grapple with next in these, these breakout sessions. Like, what, what is it? What, what are we going to do with these things? And we're going to address it from occupational science research, students and education, and advocacy and justice. Um, so what you'll do in your small groups, together with your group facilitator, you're going to develop at least three concrete strategies to address and move forward racial equity in occupational science, okay? Um, participants in the student and education group, please use the other link provided to you for your breakout room, and then we'll come back here um, to the main room at 4.30 p.m. Eastern time. And other quick reminders, um, the poster session with comment threads is still available on the SSO website. And um, our social media team is on standby on Twitter and Instagram to continue, um, so continue, excuse me, to post and tag us on, on Instagram and Twitter using Oxide USA.